I am actually uh, there is so I will um, I've actually I'll be making an announcement, but you can feel free to apparently you select it at the bottom and you will be able to see the closed captioning. Hello, everyone. Hello. How are you? I was tempted to get a beer and bring a beer to this. Well, you know what? You just put it in a mug of coffee and nobody would know the, the difference. <laughs> I do have my coffee mug as well. Coffee mug. <laughs> and uh, we have Jessica Thompson. She's just at the top. This is Don Sinclair. He's also one of my colleagues. Hello. Rachel, Rachel, are you a PhD student? I'm a master's student, actually, yeah. Nice. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Yeah, great. I'm excited to be here. Yes, it'll be an exciting talk. <laughs> oh, and live's transcript is now available. I know. I'm doing this. It's great. So, um, yeah, I'll be announcing that for everyone. So. And so we, we just have to, do we just turn it on if we want to see it? Apparently that's all you do. Um, I can see it personally. Like I've, I've enabled it so I can right. see it happening right now, but um apparently you all have to individually make that choice in order to see it if you need it right so oh, there's subtitle settings you're right working perfectly yeah it's pretty pretty impressive actually isn't it <laughs> awesome yeah and it's mostly good if you mumble then it starts to get funky but uh if you if you enunciate properly i don't know what i was gonna say exactly <laughs> Sorry, I'm just being silly. Now you're acting like my kids, Don. <laughs> they, speak, they speak gobbledygook to their iPhones and then text it to each other. <laughs> uh, well, you don't know, you don't want to know what my kids say about me. <laughs> I actually know exactly what your son says about you. So. Oh, it's true, actually. <laughs> <sighs> There's no hiding around here. <laughs> So I think I might give it a couple more minutes before we get started, Jessica. Okay. Just so you know you're muted in case you don't know. I find. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. I'm always starting, like I forget, and then I'm like, blah, 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 having a conversation myself. Nobody can hear me. I'm just like, my mouth is moving. <laughs> I recorded an entire demo last week without quite realizing that I was mute. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's gotta be annoying because it's hard enough to get these things. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> hey, Don. Hey. How's hey, it going? Everyone. Hi, Sarah, how are you? It's good. Hi, Jane. I feel like I haven't seen you and I see your name popping up in various things, <laughs> but great to see you. I hope, you know, your first times at York have been a good one. Hey, Jessica, <laughs> lovely to see you. Hey, good to see you too. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, welcome, welcome. Do you feel like a Canadian now, Sarah? I, I, you know, I tried to feel like a Canadian when, when I lived in Buffalo because I know the George Bush era. <laughs> I started, you know, I started working on my, my vowel diphthong and, you know, I really, I really cultivated a very strong Canadian affinity then. So I feel like I'm, I'm really coming back home now. It also <laughs> helps that you can see Canada from Buffalo. So, I mean, it all kind of works. <laughs> it, it worked for Sarah Palin. I don't know why it can't work for Sarah B. John. <laughs> it's right? totally, like it's Russia, totally I can true. Be that completely worked. Yes. <laughs> Would anyone like an oblique strategy while they wait? I was using these for a class. Brian Eno's oblique strategies, which are cards to prompt you when you're, when you're stuck. Would anyone like one? Sure. Yes. Okay, I'm just going to go and draw. You didn't know this was part of the presentation, did you? <laughs> Who am I drawing for? Me. Mark David. Okay, Mark yeah. David. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mark David. Can I even read that? What mistakes did you make? I can't last remember. time. Last time. Oh. Like good last time we were here. It could be, it's, it's broad, right? It's, it's very broad. <laughs> Whatever, would someone else like one? <laughs> They're scary. They're asking us to reveal ourselves with our mistake. <laughs> it's one card. I was, trying, I was trying to think of a good mistake. <laughs> Do you want me to redraw? Huh? Oh, I don't know. I'd have to think about what, what last time is. Anyone else? The problem. I think, what do you guys think about getting started? We can totally start. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll okay, show you good. my favorite. I'll show you my favorite one though, which is this one, which is trust in the you of now. Very positive. Yes. Okay, well with that, um, I guess I would like to welcome everyone to the second presentation of the Department of Computational Arts Lecture Series 2021. Um, before we get started though, I would like to do the territorial acknowledgement. Um, I would like to acknowledge our presence on the uh, traditional territories of many indigenous, indigenous nations and to recognize their long-standing relationship with these territories on which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of the university. The area known as Tecoronto has been taken care of by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat, and of course the Métis. Um, it's now home to many diverse First Nations, and we acknowledge the current treaty holders, uh, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant and agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region, for which we are very grateful. In addition, we in the Department of Computational Arts in AMPD would also like to acknowledge that the virtual networks on which our activities and gatherings are cited is a product of the Silicon Valley and the Zoom headquarters that are located in the Muwekwa and the Oholone territory. So with that, um, I also want to have a few announcements before we get started. Um, I want to let everyone know that we have closed captioning um, set up. So apparently, you just go to the bottom of your screen um, and you can just enable it on your end. Um, and so hopefully that'll make um, things easier. Um, also, I have to ask everyone to please turn off your camera um, because apparently, because we're live streaming this right now and apparently uh, it can mess up with how it's sort of put on, uh, how it's streaming to YouTube. Um, but I would like to please encourage everyone to uh, add your questions to the chat at any time, but we will hold off on answering the questions until we get to the Q&A. Uh, this presentation is going to take about 45 minutes and at the end we're going to be open to conversation where we can, we, we can get questions uh, in the, the live stream as well as in the chat inside Zoom. 
So please feel free to just fill it up and uh, we'll, we'll save it all for the end. So with that all said, it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to Jessica Thompson. Um, you can see her there at the top. Uh, she is an associate professor of hybrid media at the University of Waterloo, where she teaches in the Department of Fine Arts and the Stratford School of Interaction Design and Business. Uh, she is an affiliate researcher at the Games Institute at the University of Waterloo and also is a founding member of the UW's Black Faculty Collective. Her artistic practice investigates the ways that sound reveals spatial and social conditions within cities and how the creative use of urban data can generate new modes of citizen engagement. Thompson has an impressive exhibition history, having exhibited in international and national uh, context, including exhibitions and festivals such as Complex Festival in New York, Thinking Metropolis in Copenhagen, New Interfaces in Musical Expression in Oslo, Audible of, uh, Edifices in Hong Kong, Artist Walks in New York, and uh, the Art Gallery of Windsor's uh, Triennium. Her work has been covered in publications such as Canadian Heart, uh, the Leonardo Music Journal, Acoustic Territories, Organized Sound, and the Journal of Sonic Studies. Um, also, congratulations, she is uh, the 2019 recipient of an Ontario Government Early Research Award uh, for the project Borderline, which is the project she will be discussing with us today. So we're very lucky to hear about this, uh, this new project. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce you to Jessica Thompson. Thank you uh, so much, Jane, and thank you for, for having me here today. Emojis, I have claps. This is delightful. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me today. Um, and it's so wonderful to be uh, back at, at York. Um, my undergraduate degree is from uh, visual art at York, uh, where I majored in painting and sculpture. And I was there from 94 to 98 prior to the gigantic building going in front of the part of the building where the sculpture studio is. So for those of you who are in sculpture or spend time in sculpture, it once was a lot brighter. Um, anyways, it's great to be back. Um, today I am talking about uh, my research project, Borderline, a project that I've been working on for quite a while now, um, which is still in, in progress. Um, and I'm talking about uh, some of the research behind the project. Um, I'm slightly worried that I'm going to run out of time, but I'll, I'll do my best. So before I start, why am I not going? Uh-oh, there we go. Uh, before I start, um, I would not be anywhere uh, without uh, these weirdos and these weirdos. Um, these are my wonderful RAs. Um, uh, basically, uh, because of the Early Researcher Award, it gives you money that, that enables you to hire uh, research assistants. And I have a wonderful crew of people who um, have joined us at various times. Actually, a lot of them are fairly new to the project and are just sort of realizing what they're getting into, which is, uh, fun moments of making maps preceded by oodles and oodles of wading through spreadsheets and trying to figure out uh, data. Okay, so there we go. Um, so my work for those who don't know me, uh, my work investigates spatial and social conditions in urban environments through interactive artworks that are situated between uh, sound performance and mobile technologies. Um, I have been making work in the broad category of, of mobile sound since about 2003. Um, and my work consists of um, headphone based artworks um, and interactive pieces uh, that generate sound through the body. Um, and uh, all of them take place in urban environments. So these are some of the uh, pieces that I might be a bit better known for. This is Walking Machine from 2003, a piece that lets you walk through the city hearing the sound of your own footsteps in real time. This is Sound Bike, um, which is a bicycle that you borrow and ride. And when you gain enough speed, the bike starts giggling. This giggling then becomes uh, laughter um, as you ride faster and faster in the urban environment, which gives you a chance to compose in space with, with giggles and laughs. Um, the piece is lots of fun to ride. And this is me in front of my, one of my many apartments in Toronto. I think this is on Queen East. Uh, this is free the freestyle sound kit. Uh, and these are wearable sound pieces that actually generate uh, electronic bass beats 
as uh, people move through urban environments uh, using pressure sensors that are mounted to your feet. And this is Sweeney's suitcase. Um, and this is a piece that again, you borrow and start to move around. And what it does is it generates and broadcasts a flock of small birds uh, in response to movement. Uh, and the birds react to being swung, get very excited about being swung, and then uh, get bored, which prompts a different interaction. So Borderline is a research creation project that uses sound to create new understandings of place. Um, I've always dealt with sound in the urban environment through most of my career. And this is something uh, that uh, pushes my practice into more of um, a research-based context. Uh, the piece works as both a research tool and a creative instrument. So it consists of a mobile app um, and within the mobile app are algorithms. So using algorithms trained to identify around 100 common sounds, Borderline enables researchers to tap a button, capture a five second recording, and then automatically identify the sound and tag its location. The tags can be exported into an open format and mapped using any map making software. Um, when this sonic data is mapped alongside urban data, it helps users uncover the impact of indicators such as roads and infrastructure, street trees, changes in population and demographics, et cetera, on the sounds in our environment. Um, because the recordings are tied to their locations, Borderline also enables uh, sound artists to use the recordings to create site-specific sound art. So using a sound design model that mimics uh, spatial amplitude patterns, so the way that sounds become louder or quieter as we move closer or further away to them, the sounds can be set to play automatically, um, which creates a generative soundtrack of past sounds that fade in and out as you move through them. Expanding from Kevin Lynch's concept of edges, which are linear elements that form boundaries uh, between areas, and Jane Jacobs' definition of border vacuums, which are areas that are adjacent to borders that function like borders, the title of the project aims to articulate the invisible boundaries that affect the social space of cities. So today I'm going to be focusing on the conceptual elements of the project, including um, how data can be used to identify borderlines of socioeconomic inequality, which is what we're in the middle of doing now, um, how our understandings of sound closely align with systems of power, um, and the delights and limitations of using neural nets to listen for you. So for those of you who have the uh, closed captioning on, you may be able to experience this firsthand as it annotates and then possibly garbles what I'm saying. So this is just basically a model of how it works um, using an older version of the interface. Uh, what you do is you um, discover data near you. There is an integrated data layer that actually shows uh, different data sets and intersections between data sets. Um, and then what you do is you tap a button, the button with the ear to uh, start the tagging of sound. It identifies it or makes mistakes. And then uh, you can tap them the, set, the markers again to play them back in uh, your environment. Cities reveal themselves through sound, um, indicating territory, demographics, and functionality, and politicizing urban space through, the, through its ability to invade the space of others and to affect behavior. So really the primary objective of this project is to invent new tools to generate critical dialogues around equality and to use artistic research as a lens for, for examining the intersections between urban sound and urban data. The project evolved from a series of sound walks through gentrification that I began leading in Toronto in 2014, and I did it in cities such as Toronto, Kitchener, and then this is uh, Newcastle. Um, and basically what we were doing was we were walking through cities attempting to discover what gentrification sounded like. A uh, hint, in most cities, gentrification is actually rather quiet because as you have more and more people who um, are similar moving, living together, they have a tendency to operate on the same schedule. Whereas in neighborhoods uh, that are a bit more diverse, where you have a wider variety of people, you'll see sort of people at various hours of the day uh, from various walks of life. So as I was leading these sound walks, and for those unfamiliar, uh, a sound walk is any walk whose purpose is listening in the urban environment. Um, I began to become really curious about uh, urban data 
and how urban data that uh, evolves from locative technologies and uh, that we engage with on our phones or generate through our phones affect the social spaces of cities and how sound walking could be used as a lens for critically engaging with urban data. So uh, starting I think in 20, 16, um, I started shifting uh, the way I was leading sound walks so that we could actually follow paths created by uh, this data. The piece also evolved out of my own desire to find a better way of sound mapping. Um, and for those who are uh, some people in the audience, you will probably recognize these images uh, from Murray Schaefer's uh, The Soundscape of the Tuning of the World. You know, while sound Soundscape studies has been a recognized discipline since the early 70s. Um, our systems that we use to develop, to notate sound have historically been limited in scope. Um, you have wonderful hand-drawn maps, they're beautiful, but they are kind of incomplete abstractions of the environment. You can only uh, notate a certain amount at a certain time based on the presence of the map maker. And then uh, even with more recent projects, so there was a project that came out of Ryerson a few years ago where you had um, microphones that were mounted in various locations in Toronto and you were able to sort of uh, look at amplitude because they were examining uh, needing to rework uh, the noise ordinances to reflect new patterns of geography in Toronto. Um, when you do that, you actually only have the sound that's coming into the microphone. So if the microphone's not moving, you're really just getting a portion of the city's soundscape. So what I was interested in doing uh, was actually creating, using mobile technologies to make better sound maps. So the other thing that drew me to the project is my belief that how we perceive, understand and interpret sound is closely aligned with systems of power. Um, and that the systems of power are particularly evident in how we define, interpret, and respond to noise. In its broadest sense, noise is defined as unwanted or unwelcome sound. Um, but our understanding of what sound and what noise is, is really based on who you are, where you are, and how much agency you have over the space that you're in. And of course, noise has a particular impact when it occurs close to home. Um, in 2015, geographer Ben Wellington created a series of area maps of New York City noise complaints using municipal open data, and uh, it got a lot of attention. Not unsurprisingly, the largest category of the over 140,000 noise-related complaints between winter 2013 and fall 2014 was loud music or parties. This makes sense. Um, we also, when we're talking about uh, the word noise, we often use it to describe the sounds of the other. Um, in other words, we're not going to complain about a party that we're invited to ourselves. In the sonic color line, race and the cultural politics of listening, Jennifer Stoper describes the phenomenon of the listening ear, which is an ideological filter shaped by dominant, meaning normative and white, uh, practices of listening. She says, the sonic color line describes the process of racializing sound how and why certain bodies are expected to produce, desire, and live amongst particular sounds. And its product, the hierarchical division sounded between whiteness and blackness. The listening ear drives the sonic color line. It is a figure for how dominant listening practices accrue and change over time, as well as a descriptor for how the dominant culture exerts pressure on individual listening practices to conform to the sonic color, to conform to the sonic color line's norms. Let's get some water. So through her analysis of the what she calls the unspoken power of racialized listening, Stover can provide, provides us with a framework on how we can understand uh, sound, particularly how we think of sound as being neutral, when really this idea of neutrality is based on uh, dominant groups. So this is one of uh, Ben Wellington's maps. Um, and while choreopath math, maps like this give us a good idea of which neighborhoods uh, have the most complaints, it doesn't really show us what's happening street to street. Um, so one of the things that I did fairly early on was I actually downloaded the data and started to uh, remap Wellington's maps, but using point data rather than uh, area data. So this is, uh, all of the complaints about loud music and parties from New York City 
Um, and this is the category just residential building and house. These are complaints about loud music and parties. And the location type is club, bar, restaurant. Sorry. Um, I can't really see my title. Sorry, I'm just gonna move you. Um, these are uh, residential building house and club bar restaurants. Oops. Here we go. Um, these are locations of Airbnb rentals, also in New York. Um, this is courtesy of Tom Slee, a Waterloo-based researcher who uh, developed a script to actually pull data from Airbnb.com. And then uh, a bit of work uh, from my amazing RA, May Hall, who is able to um, integrate this data in with uh, the Google neighborhood algorithm to just get it into place according to neighborhood. Um, these are not all the Airbnbs, by the way. This is just uh, the Airbnbs that are designated as being whole home or apartment. There's everything together. And there is everything uh, together with uh, the class D districts uh, from uh, New York City's red line maps. Oops, there. So for those not familiar, uh, the Homeowners Loan Corporation's risk assessment maps were created during the Great Depression. Um, and these are often called uh, red line maps. Uh, they happened uh, in 239 cities across the US and they divided neighborhoods into four color coded grades. Not surprisingly, the undesirable uh, fourth grade or D areas housed most of the 6 million African Americans who had left the South during the Great Migration. These maps are an example of what Richard Rothstein calls de jure segregation, where racism is embedded within public policies designed to segregate, separate, alienate, and exclude Black Amer Americans from the opportunities and incentives provided to white Americans um, and to profit from their marginalized status. The resulting trauma um, permeates almost every aspect of contemporary Black experience. And uh, just so you can see, so each of the areas um, in, all, in the cities are, if you take a close look, you can actually see that they are labeled. And each of these uh, labels coincides with an area description. Uh, so this is uh, from uh, Detroit. Um, and as you can see, basically they just fill in the data, including the super duper helpful percent Negro checkbox. Um, I should also say that uh, not all D areas uh, contained African Americans and also uh, it wasn't just African Americans who were in these D areas. Um, in the 30s, you know, they didn't like anybody. Um, so if you were Jewish, if you were Italian, um, if you were Ukrainian, uh, they would also make a note of that under foreign families and then listing the nationalities. Um, they also use coded language to describe um, the African Americans. So you see lots of instances of um, the use of the word slum, um, you know, fire hazards, Negro colony, um, unreliable tenants, um, descriptions of C grade areas, which are yellow areas, which were adjacent to uh, the D areas, used phrases like, like Negro encroachment or danger of Negro infiltration to justify their lower rating. And here is, uh, you can see patterns of migration through Detroit. This is one of my maps uh, that I did using these area descriptions and actually showing where the uh, African-Americans lived. And not surprisingly, you can see the locations of the D areas and then uh, highways. 
So uh, you can't understand cities without understanding black and brown geography. And part of the fun slash not fun part of this work involves researching black geographies in cities such as Chicago, Detroit, and Toronto alongside uh, trajectories of my own family history. So um, in celebration of Black History Month, I've decided to share uh, a family photo. Um, so uh, my family, I am biracial, um, but my family um, is from uh, Chatham, Kent. Uh, we escaped slavery. Uh, Cornelius Thompson escaped slavery from Virginia um, just around the Civil War and then uh, settled in the area. Um, and uh, as more Blacks settled in Canada, uh, what happened was, of course, there was segregation within local schools. So not only did you have to kind of travel a long way to get to school, you were often not allowed to sit, either not allowed to attend a local school, or you weren't allowed to sit with other children. So um, I don't know whether you can see this, my mouse, but what I will say is in this photo in the very, very center um, is uh, my great uncle, William Thompson, Sitting beside him uh, in the white shirt uh, is my grandfather. Um, I have uh, great aunts in this photo. Uh, my grandma is the uh, little girl in the middle who's squinting her eyes in the sun. Um, so basically uh, what happened was uh, the local community, including my great uncle, uh, decided to start the school so that kids could just go to school together. Uh, this is the second racially integrated one room schoolhouse in North America. The first one was in Buxton, just north. Um, I'll draw your attention to the little girl, the second in from the left. Um, this is my Aunt Lorraine. This is my grandmother's little sister. Um, and uh, in the late 60s, uh, my great aunt actually um, moved from Toronto with her husband uh, to Chicago uh, during the uh, civil rights era and founded the Diversified Development and Property Management Company in Chicago, which provided low income housing development services for black communities. So during a time where it was almost impossible to get a mortgage when you were black, my aunt uh, helped to give people mortgages. So um, I come about this interest in, um, in housing equality, uh, honestly. Um, her husband was a political cartoonist for the Chicago Independent, and I just wanted to uh, share a few photos with you. These are some of his drawings um, showing what was happening at the time. This is one of my favorite. This is uh, James Meredith, who was admitted to uh, the University of Mississippi in 1961 um, because I guess his last name didn't seem ethnic. And then uh, once they realized he was black, uh, they removed him and he sued them and won and got to go to school. So why is all this important? Um, all this is important because Areas that have historically been housed uh, poor and black people in the US, but also in Canada, um, are areas that are getting gentrified and people are getting pushed out. Um, this is easier to see in the US than in Canada because you do have this sort of uh, legacy of the Hulk maps. In Canada, it's much more nebulous. But you can definitely see when you start to map out data, this is a map of um, all the location of Airbnb rentals um, that were categorized as whole home in Toronto with the average walk score per neighborhood. You can see that uh, uneven geographies are everywhere. I want to share some maps um, that we're working on now. Um, this is a, a sort of an in-progress map from Raquel Rowe, one of our students. What she's doing right now is she's mapping um, access to food. So she's mapping grocery stores, fruit markets, convenience stores, and big box retail locations uh, in dialogue with the Ontario Marginalization Index. Uh, the OMI is uh, measures four metrics. Uh, it measures instability, um, it looks at ethnic concentration, it looks at uh, dependency, um, and one more that I'm blanking with. Come back to that. Um, basically what it does is it identifies which neighborhoods um, are particularly unstable. Um, so what she did is she's coding out and she's marking the location of big box stores versus food banks uh, versus uh, 
convenience stores, et cetera. Um, and what she's finding is that in downtown Hamilton, you actually have, you know, that's where you have your uh, food banks, but also there is a lack of uh, larger, more luxurious grocery stores. And we can see this um, in lots of other neighborhoods, including Toronto. Uh, this is a new Groves, uh, map of uh, walkability to public transit. He's working on, uh, he started out with Waterloo and now he's working on some other cities in uh, Ontario. Um, what he did was he was actually able to map the walking distance to various uh, LRT and bus stops in uh, Kitchener-Waterloo um, by using uh, rather than as the crow flies, actually using the amount of distance that's on the sidewalk itself. Um, and one of the things that, and that's important because of course you can live fairly close to a bus stop, but if you don't have a sidewalk, uh, you can't really get to it. Um, this work comes, ties in of course to critical cartography and critical cartography challenges academic cartography by linking geographic knowledge with power and thus it is political. Um, and this manifests in all sorts of ways. Uh, this is uh, from the Detroit Geographic Expedition. Uh, this is where commuters uh, run over black children on the points downtown track. Um, for those not familiar, the Detroit Geographic Expedition was a group of students uh, that was headed by William Bunge. Uh, they were at Wayne State. And what they were doing was they were trying to um, map phenomenon which was happening in black neighborhoods, which is that when the downtown streets were rerouted to make it easier uh, for white people in the suburbs to get into and out of downtown. So they were trying to kind of deal with the fact that they had white flight happening. Um, kids were getting run over. In fact, on one street corner, uh, six kids got hit in six months. Um, so this data was known, but it was impossible to find. So working in collaboration with other community members and pressuring the police, they were able to finally sort of gather this data and to discover this collation. I want to include something from uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. And then there's, of course, numerous other examples. There is Margaret Pierce's Coming Home to Indigenous Place Names in Canada, which maps Canada through uh, place names from local Indigenous groups. This took forever for her to do. Um, there was areas that were fairly difficult where you had uh, places that uh, could be told to her but could not be mapped, places that she couldn't, that wouldn't be known to her because uh, even though she was Indigenous, um, that she was not from uh, the correct band. And then also along the border, um, places that were called two different things, depending on whether you were in the US or Canada. There's Mimi Onuha's uh, Missing Data Sets, which is a wonderful project where she creates an online rep repository of data sets that ought to be, but aren't available. So when we are uh, capturing our data um, and trying to figure out ways of marking uh, uneven geographies and cities, uh, we are truly trying to uh, take a feminist approach to data. Um, so uh, what we are doing is we are trying to actually uh, be as inclusive as possible. When we are uh, gathering data, we're trying to practice uh, principles of data feminism. I'm going to see if I can actually flip over to phone. Oops, you guys are in the way. Um, anyone who has not read Data Feminism, I highly recommend that you read it. It's available through open access. Um, just doing things like documenting our data, showing the data, recognizing that all the data that we're finding is not necessarily going to be accurate or complete. Um, trying to look at more than one source of the data and then always acknowledging our sources. There's also, while I am out of my um, uh, presentation. I'll just showcase some other excellent projects. There is the Mapping Prejudice Project at the University of Minnesota, the Opportunity Atlas. I hope this is all coming through. Queering the Map out of Montreal. Uh, Toronto's COVID Eviction Tracker. 
And for those who are uh, maybe sound scholars in the room, uh, the Listening to the City Handbook is put out through MIT. And basically it contains uh, methods of uh, sound walking critically. So it kind of goes through and showcases projects and gives methodologies, etc. Okay. I hope that's right. So uh, one of the more important heuristics of the project is to create a flexible, inclusive framework that uh, embodies feminist approaches to data and also is just open. Um, I think one, I think I'm probably the most excited about this part of the project, um, even more, this is more even, even more exciting than the neural nets. Um, this is probably just because I'm a big spreadsheet nerd. But one of the more important features of the app is the export function, which enables you to export uh, the sound, the tagged sound that you have um, as a CSV file, which means that you can integrate your data into any map making platform. Um, it is incredibly easy to use. Um, there are some other apps out there that let you uh, do this. However, they, they capture data and kind of trap them in uh, the app so you can't get it out. Um, or uh, the closest project that I found to it um, was so complicated that unless you have a GIS background, you weren't actually able to figure out a way of using it uh, easily. Oops. Um, so since I'm using machine learning, it's important to understand uh, that neural nets are only as inclusive as the data they are trained on, as you can probably tell by the mistakes that our uh, live closed captioning is creating. Um, the neural nets in this project, uh, which enable users to identify sound in almost real time, use the free sound database, which is a hierarchical collection of 632 classes of sound uh, populated with audio samples from freesound.org and organized using Google's audio set ontology. Uh, the data set embodies principles of feminist data by design. They're in an open platform where volunteers can annotate and revise track labels and categories. Uh, the process of data set creation is open and transparent, and it's organized into an intuitive interfa interface uh, that is available through an open license to support further research. Um, so these were the categories uh, that we used to train our neural nets. Um, and I made some adjustments just for consistency and also to contextualize the categories around it, gender. So you can see from looking at some of this, uh, what most of these uh, categories are um, or the types of things that we are, we are recording in that data set. Lots of interior signs. I don't know about glockenspiel or gong. And I changed uh, male, female, and also child. And I don't know, within an app, just chewing and mastication just seemed too long and didn't send the right message. Um, the neural nets actually do make some pretty interesting mistakes. Um, they, uh, the, to my RA's delight, uh, any sounds in the bathroom, including toilet flushing, it's very accurate, <laughs> probably because uh, you get good recordings and acoustics in the bathroom. Um, any background uh, sound, uh, background music, if you're in like a cafe and you are uh, using it to tag sound there, it sometimes thinks that it's like a bus. Um, I think just because of how the sound is broadcast from overhead. Um, also, I believe that all the sounds of public transit involve talking. Um, it's really weird. It gets motor noise. Um, if there's any cat people in the audience, uh, meows are, are very accurate as verified by my cats. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just kind of interesting the mistakes that they make. So moving forward, what we are trying to do is we're trying to actually set up um, a loop back, kind of a shallow network where the corrections that people are able to make in the app. Um, so basically if you get a bad category now, you can fix it. Um, but we actually want those corrections to be able to go back and uh, help the neural nets become smarter. And these are just the uh, cards. 
So uh, I said earlier that uh, the way I often present this is uh, by leading uh, sound walks through various cities. Um, and I have no problem actually presenting uh, beta versions of this project in order to gather feedback and present it, et cetera. I believe in presenting, um, doing research through dissemination and presenting works of progress. Uh, so this image is actually from uh, a sound walk in Struler in Denmark, uh, which was presented uh, as part of the ReSound Festival in Alborg. And so what we did was um, we were using the app to tag sounds um, and then play them back in space. So we would tag the sounds and you guys can see me. Um, we would tag the sounds and then actually sort of uh, some of us would hold up our phones and sort of broadcast them as other others walked through them. Um, and, but we'd also, um, as we were walking and listening, um, I gave everybody one of these card sets and I would stop them and actually have them um, use their cards to identify which sounds they were hearing, which created a really interesting information visualization just of the categories or according to color. Uh, so for this one, you can see that there's these sort of lines of green just under uh, the woman's head and those were natural sounds. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop there and I'm going to open it up for questions um, about sound, about public space, about black geographies, about map making, um, et cetera. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jessica. That was really interesting. Um, yeah, I didn't, I kind of lost track of time there. So I was so interested. Actually, um, I should note that for once I was early. <laughs> Someone take a picture. It was great. Um, can, can I see you? Can I see you guys now? Or yeah, what you can do is stop screen sharing and then we can ask people to turn on their, their cameras. That would be super. How do I, okay, stop share. Uh, where are you? Zoom. Hey, people. Hey, everyone. 4 p.m. on a Friday. I am so delighted. I'm just trying to see where all the wine glasses are. Maybe they're off camera. There's wine? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't I tell you? <laughs> Stop. We need wine. <laughs> um, so... Maybe, uh, well, first, I guess we could just um, thank you very much, Jessica. Is there any uh, immediate questions? Um, I'm, I've got the chat open, but I figure if we're doing it this way, um, if anybody would, has an immediate question, you can feel free to either write it in the chat or just open your mic and, and speak it yourself. Um, so maybe, oh, sorry, Marcus. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, so thank you, Jessica, that was a great presentation. Um, I'm, uh, I'm curious about how you go about mapping kind of like your, your process to know what you want to map sonically. Like how do you plan it and how you engage going out there and getting people involved and grouping them together? Yeah, um, it, it's kind of a two-parter. So um, often what I will do is I will actually look for local data in the city I'm presenting. Um, so uh, for uh, in Denmark, it was very odd because I, I really love following the path of Airbnbs. Um, it's just that part of me that kind of feels very strongly about Airbnbs. Um, however, uh, the where I was invited to do the sound walk was further away from the much larger city that we were that the conference was in. So uh, what I ended up doing was actually uh, looking at. Like there were a few Airbnbs, but it wasn't anywhere near where we, we, where we could walk to. So I actually started pulling um, things using Yelp um, and uh, Google and just high ratings, because that also shows you really interesting information. There's this, um, you know, weird geography of highly rated restaurants and, and places. So uh, what I do is I pull the data and then I determine a path through the data. So that can lead us to all sorts of weird places. Um, but um, I find that by mapping it, um, you can start to identify clusters and, and overlaps or even use ArcGIS to kind of 
if you if you're familiar with ArcGIS, you can actually use it to cluster the data, but you can also just like map it and just do it as a transparency so you can start to see those densities and then you follow the data. That's great, thank you. Can you um can you tell me uh, sort of a little bit about first of all your love with Airbnb and and the ch why you make those choices? What does that tell you about a space and what what is it specifically that intrigues you about that? Uh, I find Airbnb is intriguing because it's it's a data set that actually um, it's one of those data sets that that points to other sources of data. So when you're looking at Airbnbs, and, and I have to say that it's it's harder and harder to actually pull Airbnbs. So I'm, I'm trying to actually not include that in the next version of the app. I'm, the data I showed you um, is actually very old data because they just kind of like, <laughs> um, so, you know, Airbnbs are really good, are really good indicators of gentrification. Um, if you want a profit from your Airbnb, you are not going to have it away from amenities like restaurants. You're not going to have it away from transit. Um, in mapping out Toronto, I noticed that um, it pretty much just aligned with all the condos. Um, and then there was a strip kind of going up Young Street and towards Shepherd, um, also again, falling condos, but again, near, near um, transit. Um, so there is a correlation between walk scores and Airbnbs. Um, also, Airbnbs, there's a lot of crummy stuff that happens with Airbnbs. Um, you know, um, like many of our online systems, it reinforces systems of inequality that we see in other areas. So for example, if you're a black Airbnb host, you will get less than a white host, even when you both are in a black neighborhood. Um, and and it's uh, there's also, you know, there's the incident a couple of years ago when the the filmmakers in LA were uh, called <laughs> Airbnb while black. So therefore some called, they were there and some called the police because they looked suspicious. Um, it also really disrupts, um, it disrupts geographies by really reducing the amount of available housing stock. And I'm sure this is particularly acute um, for you in Toronto. Um, I live in Hamilton now because commuting to Waterloo from Toronto is impossible, but uh, I lived in downtown Toronto for more or less like 20 years and all over. So I'm pretty familiar with most of the neighborhoods, but really what happens is when you're Airbnb, you can make way, way more Airbnb um, your place, uh, having a condo and putting on an Airbnb than you can renting it. Um, you just make money hand over fist, uh, except because of COVID. Um, and then uh, what happens is it basically reduces the amount of available housing stock and then drives up rent costs. Um, so it creates uh, a housing shortage, it creates rent gaps. Um, so not only does it sort of give you a good indication as to which neighborhoods are, are changing, but perhaps are not quite out of reach yet, um, it also is something that is actually disrupting urban geographies, especially in cities like Toronto, especially in cities like Montreal, especially Vancouver. Um, and it's just kind of getting worse. I was really pleased to see that there was, uh, was I, don't know, actually, I don't know if it was passed or not. There was an ordinance that basically banning uh, Airbnbs in a way in Toronto saying that you had to actually live in the place. Did that go through? Okay, cool. It'd be really interesting to map that now because there's probably far fewer of them. Does anybody else have any questions? I don't want to ask them all. Oh, Diane. Hey. You're muted. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah. There we go. Try number two. It's always got to happen. Welcome to Hamilton, Jessica. I didn't know that. Hamilton Perambulatory Unit. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we must perambulate sometimes. We must perambulate, yes. <laughs> um, I was wondering if we would have the chance to um, experience your app. I know you're talking about uh, testing and dissemination and yes, try it out. Yes, and I have an apology to make. Um, we, um, so, Nay Hall, my RA again, and, and I were gunning to try to actually get a new version up so that we could actually just, I could give you the bottled version. You could just have your own little version that's not on the app store. Um, unfortunately, we have run into some server issues where we are migrating over from the very expensive Amazon AWS 
which charges us whether we're using or not, to the much better and partially subsidized um, Microsoft uh, Azure, who calls a network as, I don't know. But basically I was able to get some uh, credits through the Waterloo AI Institute and have it covered. So we were trying to move it over and we just kind of slightly broke it. So it's partially back up and we just had to, but if you want, actually, if you guys want to message me or just send me an email to my Waterloo address, um, I would be happy to actually just kind of add you to the block of testers and yeah, that'd be awesome. I will do that. I'll be happy to, to test it out with you. Okay. That sounds awesome. Thank you. And anybody can contact me and I can put you in contact with Jessica. Yes. Um, just, uh, I just have questions about, and just so that I can understand it completely. So you have uh, the app and um, the app is available on in the app store. So anybody can download it. And so I guess what one thing that I thought was really intriguing um, is that you call this, um, that this is like an infrastructure, right? That people, um, so other sound artists can use this as well. Like, I was curious about that. Um, first of all, that's my first question. Could you maybe talk a little bit about how it's an inter infrastructure or how maybe other artists can use this? Yeah, I mean, it's because it enables you to actually, um, it, it records a five second sample in order to identify the sound. It can actually identify um, the sound after about two seconds rather than five seconds, but five seemed more fun. Um, so basically um, what you can do is you can actually use it to capture short recordings and then play back, play back your sound when you return to the space. So there is a method of, of soundscape creation which involves uh, locative sound where you're putting sound into um, different environments and sort of tagging with GPS. And this, this goes way back to like, Terry Reap doing this in the 90s. Um, and so what you can actually do is you can start to deliberately tag sound um, and actually sort of create a roving soundscape that you can then experience on your phone. Um, so one of the other things we're working on is trying to figure out a way to actually make your recordings public so you can actually share tracks between people. Um, and then it's um, sometimes people also use it as just a method of expression. So um, I once had a poet attend one of my tests and she was really excited because she wanted to make sort of like spatialized poetry where you could, you could sort of drift around and hear voices coming in and out. Um, and um, yeah, it's just, it's an open flexible platform. And, and this is something that um, extends back from other parts of my practice. Um, I found, um, I didn't realize I was doing this until someone told me, um, I was chatting with my friend Jordan. He basically said, do you, do you realize all your works are called like tools, machines, or devices? And I was like, oh, yes. Um, and so, you know, I, I sort of see my, my work as a framework around listening, a framework around engaging in public space, a framework around performance. So really what I'm trying to do with this is I have my interests and I have the reason why I want to use the project, but really you can use the project however you want. Um, and, and I find that that's something really interesting um, that I have to go through with everything I make is how much of the project um, do I need to kind of lock in place for myself before I can then give it to the audience. But giving my work to, the, to audiences is just something that I have always done. Um, and I think that, you know, you can use it to build your own piece. You can use it, um, you can use it to document uh, after hours construction sounds in your neighborhood. You can use it to work with community group to be able to better understand sound in their space. You can use it with your students. Like it, it's just, it's, it's pretty easy and open. And so um, I'm happy to kind of get it out and to have a data layer where we can actually look at these borders and cities. Um, and beyond that, what you do with it is completely um, up to you. That's interesting because that, that was actually one of my first questions and I think you kind of answered it in a, in a okay. nice way. It's, um, there's one of the things about Jessica's work is that um, there's a like playful aspect, right? You create, you, you normally, and this is what's interesting. And I, I think, you know, now you're using people's cell phones, but normally you create the device. And so yeah. you have this device, but the device itself is precious. And so like we showed uh, Jessica's swinging suitcases at our show interaction. And you know you have to sign out the suitcases, and then there's the fear that they're going to steal it, or that it's going to break, or that it's going to drop. But so there's all that. That's one thing that I'm noticing that's changing in in your approach, which I think is really, it's like you've solved it in a certain way that you can put it out in the world and it can be played with and engaged yeah. with. 
Um, but one of the things that I wasn't necessarily hearing before, but now I've heard it, is that you're still maintaining that playfulness that has been present in all your other work, but the way you even talk about people using this app in you know, freestyle poetry and exploring, and you're still mm -hmm. holding on to all those other bits. So do you want to talk a little bit about how that sort of fits into your trajectory? Uh, sure. I think that, you know, playfulness is something that, um, I think it's something that my, my audiences have taught me. Um, when I first made the sound, I, when I first made the walking machine, which is the one where you get to listen to your own footsteps, I was actually considering it as a very serious meditative piece. And then people immediately just started playing around with, you know, what happens if I walk on grass? What happens if I splash in a puddle? What happens, you know, so it, it's very, um, the playful aspect is something that kind of, emerged and then once it emerged, I couldn't get it back. Um, I think that, you know, it's, so I, I think that it's, it's, it has to be fun. Like, I mean, I think that, you know, if, if you're going to engage people in what essentially is a, a large scale sound project, you know, this piece gets better. The only way this works is if a lot of people use it. Um, because again, if you only have a few people using your project, you, um, you get sort of this narrow understanding of sound in place. So the more people who use it, the better, um, because sound is temporal and it's spatial and it's something where we don't hear it all the time. Um, so it actually, um, the sound, the phone is kind of a necessary evil in order to have it be very, very distributed very, very quickly. Um, it's challenging using phones because of the preciousness, non-preciousness of phones. I mean, you are presenting your artwork in the same platform that wakes us up or, um, you know, entertains us or has our calendar or our email or we use it to talk to our mom. Um, and, and it's a little strange um, having uh, it happen on a device like that because there you do lose the wonderful object that you can borrow and take out. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I'm just, I'm not particularly precious about my objects, even when I make them. Um, I don't want anyone to get hurt. Like when you make pieces that involve bikes, you always worry about people like falling and people sometimes do, but I, I tend to not worry too much about like what happens to the work because I figure I can remake it. Um, and those suitcases are getting more banged. And eventually I'm going to have to find more suitcases for the second suitcase because those, those suckers are totally banged up. Um, but um, I think that uh, I've always had a little bit of a casualness around the devices I use to present my work because to me, it's not actually the work until you use it. Um, it it's not, it's just a thing, right? Like it, it's not, um, it's just an artifact until you actually perform with it. And so... Um, I always get kind of upset when people are like, oh, well, present your work. And then they put in the gallery and it's like, and I'm like, no, no, people have to go outside. We need waivers. It'll be okay. Um, because uh, it, it really is something that is, um, it's performative. I don't need documentation of it. You know, you can take it out and do whatever you want with it. And, and what happens between you and my artwork is up to you. Um, it is, a little strange from, I think, uh, the way that I was trained and you were, I mean, we both were sculpture people, um, um, though you still more, more of a sculptor than I am. But I mean, you know, when you're, when you come up in art school, I think we're taught to make these artifacts and precious objects that then will, you know, hopefully one day be gifted to a museum. Hopefully your relatives don't throw them out, whatever. <clears throat> you're making cultural property. And with me, it's, it's almost like, um, I don't think I'm going to end up leaving anything. Um, I think it'll just be what happens when people try it and the thing that it happens with you. And I think that to me, that's a gift um, that maybe I can give you. And it's a way of leaving something in the world that is, that is living. Um, but I don't think that I have to actually have this object for people to behold for generations. I just think I want people I think I just want people to think differently about sound in public space and to engage in something that is meaningful for them and to kind of get inspired to do other things so we can all continue to move our discipline forward. And that's what I'm trying to do. Does anybody have any more questions? Because I got more, <laughs> I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> Anybody else? No? Um, okay, then I'll just ask another question. Um, 
so I'm still trying to map the whole project out because it's such mm -hmm. a, a big thing. And so you had a lot of, you spent a lot of time talking about critical map, mapping, map, map making, and you have RAs who are engaging in this map making also using, I guess, your neural networks and the, and the app and all that. Is that correct? Partially, we've had to actually delay a little bit of the spatial research with the app. So um, when I um, started out with having suddenly having more money that I could use to only hire students, which is kind of awesome, um, yeah, didn't cover, <laughs> couldn't figure out how to pay for the server. But yeah, no, they, you had these students. Um, and um, what the plan was, was to actually use the app to be able to um, to to actually go into cities and actually do some spatial research initially in cities. But because COVID and, and sending people out in the world and actually to do that stuff, I actually can't do that part. So what we've done is we are we are shifting over to critical map making. So what the army of RAs are doing, and these are these are five hour a week, a week RAs, because we don't, in fine arts, we don't have people who come and work on our projects, right? So it's not it's not a matter of someone coming to work with me and they're spending their entire degree just doing this. Uh, people are different majors. I have a blend of undergrads and grads. Um, if somebody has a supervisor, I'm usually sort of writing a note and going, hey, can they do take on an extra five hours and would that be okay with you? It's extra money. Like, So, they, so it's really a lot of people kind of working around five hours a week. Um, but what we're doing is we're digging through data. So we're trying to map municipal data, we're mapping um, demographic data, we're trying to get as narrow as we can in these cities. Um, the areas I'm looking at are uh, Toronto, Hamilton, uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, and Ottawa, which were the four fastest growing cities in the last census. Um, and uh, from there, I think that I'd like to look at more cities because of course we've had this change in geography that's happened through COVID where we're seeing people move out to outlying areas. So um, while that's super cool for people who are able to you know, buy their first home in like Stratford, um, it's, might, we might end up seeing sort of the same uneven geographies that we have seen in larger cities and actually happening with smaller cities. So really um, the, what they're doing is they're plowing through open data sets, they're making maps, um, they're trying to find these areas of overlap. Um, I'm teaching them about information design and the process of map making takes forever. It is, it's so funny because maps look so simple and it is just hours and hours of data collection um, trying to find answers to your questions through disparate data sets, trying to upload data that doesn't want to upload, converting data, getting data that's in a horrible format. So you're basically, basically spending time fixing it so you can even map it. And that's all sort of hidden labor. Um, and uh, it just, it takes a long time. It's stunning how much time it takes actually. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Um, one other question is, how do you see the integration of the sonic portion with the critical maps? Do you see that some at some point coming together? Are they going to overlay? Do you want people in those cities to start gathering sounds? Is like what is the the end game, I guess, in your mind uh, for for the this end, project? The end game is to recruit people to actually um, start annotating sound in their cities, uh, so that I personally, if they choose to share their data with me. Um, can interface that with these uh, uneven geographies that I'm seeing in these in these maps. Um, I think that it's important. Um, we we kind of know anecdotally that there is a difference between uh, noisy neighborhoods and quiet neighborhoods. And quiet neighborhoods um, often are neighborhoods that are are wealthier. Um, we sort of there's a lot of things that we know anecdotally because we spend time in cities and we we kind of just know it. Uh, finding it in the data is pretty pretty interesting. So the end game is to really um, be able to create these wide scale sound maps that are useful beyond themselves. And so that you can actually use sonic data as a way of understanding what is going on cities. So moving beyond demographics, moving beyond things like traffic patterns, um, what is going on in cities in terms of sound because there's a relationship between sound and, and health as well. Um, and there is this deep relationship between uh, sound and sound complaints um, and uh, people's socioeconomic status. Like you can call the police on the party down the street, 
but only if you feel safe calling the police. Um, and, and, and you can make as much noise as you want if you feel comfortable being in a space. Like we, we're, we are quieter in spaces where we feel less comfortable. Um, so I think that it, it's, I think that it's an under-researched area um, when we think about, when we think about cities. Um, and I think just sound is my jam. So that's what I, I, I do. Um, but I think that there's a lot to be kind of discovered and explored. Um, and I not, may not be able to do it all, but hopefully um, there's enough people out there in the world who are looking at this. And there's more and more people who are looking at this, who are looking at racialized sound and gentrification and that sort of stuff that we can actually contribute to a body of knowledge. Okay, actually, uh, we have two, uh, we've, uh, Lisa and Marcus have both put their hands up. I'm, I actually just saw the hands at the same time, so I can't see which one is first. <laughs> okay, so shall we just, uh, Lisa and then Marcus? Okay, you've, uh, your, your need to, yeah, there. Okay, Lisa. sorry, thanks. Um, I was just giving Marcus a high five. Um, I, I was curious how you are, uh, approaching like density, like I, I, I missed a little bit about how the app works as mm -hmm. like if you're recording at a particular point in time and you, you're capturing this like walk, like how, how do you capture like if you want to know like what is the aggregation of like what is this neighborhood like in the morning or the afternoon or the mm -hmm. density of sounds like as opposed to just the ontology of sounds like you know one meow versus like or like my neighborhood like wow there's lots of chickens like you know, versus one chicken. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe you covered that, but that, that was my question. No, that's a really good question. Um, I think it's gonna be a matter of capturing sound over time. In terms of identifying clusters, um, you can do that automatically um, in GIS systems like ArcGIS or just through careful mapping. Um, I think it's gonna be a matter of um, capturing enough sound over time to identify the, the density. Um, the neural nets can identify some plural sounds, like it does have a thing where it says traffic as opposed to motor. Um, but I think that it's uh, going to involve um, more data, but then also probably some smarter um, or different retrained neural nets. Um, it, it's something where um, I haven't encountered that yet, but I think that is going to be what is going to have to be done. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. I'm looking, sorry guys, I'm looking at different parts of your own grid, so I'm like, Marcus. Um, I just wanted to add to something that you said earlier about, uh, can I totally sympathize with you working with data? Because I had a chance to work in a data visualization lab, working with data. And you know, you don't realize this until you, until you start trying to extract meaning out of it. And you're like, well, we have to learn this part of our GIS in order to get that out of there. And, um, so I wanted to know how you, uh, I kind of navigate that, I guess that technical end of things. And um, the second part of my question um, related to um, one of the projects we worked on in that lab was called Student Move TO. And one of the things that um, we were wondering about that exercise was it was just really trying to understand where students were traveling and understand their experiences of traveling to the four big universities in the GTA. And mm -hmm. what we always ask is like, well, we're just going with all the statistical data and CSVs about movement and maybe contrast it with uh, public transit. But it made me think, hearing you speak about your projects, about these different medias that are not explored, about the sonic aspect of that experience of the student going through that. And I, I was just making, I was just trying to understand how you see your work being able to help, I guess, augment other existing research that are trying to extract these kind of things that are just really textual data that doesn't provide a lot of meaning about the true experience that a student is going through mm -hmm. travel. Do you see an opportunity for your work to kind of enlighten those things? Uh, yeah, uh, so you're also asking, let me, let me start with the last part of your question and then I'll come back to the uh, first where you're talking about tech. Um, I think so, I mean, I think that um, there, there are two parts of the project. So, um, or the, you know, really the, the mobile app started um, because I was trying to map sound and I needed a way to do it where I was like, I need an open way of doing this. I'm like, I'll, I'll just make this. I'm like, oh, cool. This would actually be really good to have for other people. Um, so um, 
the you can use neural nets to identify the sounds it think it thinks it hears creates a recording but there is also a notebook where you can actually, um, like if you're deaf or you want to record other things, uh, make other notes, you can actually just hit the notebook and like record and write down text notes. And again, you'll just have your text note, you'll have your coordinates, it'll come out as a CSV, bam. Um, so I think that what you could do with a project like that is you could, if you're doing a study, you could invite students to kind of like record their feelings around the sound or if they're tagging sound actually like have them write a few notes and then maybe sort of use um, something like sentiment analysis or just sort of go through go through and figure out like what words are students using. Um, so that, that exists now in the project. In fact, um, we had the notebook done before we actually had the neural nets done because getting neural nets on a cell phone is really hard. Um, but um, but um, so I, I'd imagine you could do it that way. Um, in terms of the technical needs, so the um, I can design apps, I cannot do the back end. So those are my RAs. Um, so Nahal has been with me the longest. I hired him when he was a fourth year systems design engineer student. He stayed with the project when he got his first job at Foursquare four months before he finished school, engineers, um, and then and then worked at uh, Foursquare and then kind of came back because um, he's actually a, a pilot. Um, he's always wanted to fly. So he actually left his big tech job to actually teach people how to fly planes. Um, so uh, he's kind of always been with the project and kind of taking my crazy designs and like getting it, um, making the back end happen. Um, I had another RA who's now at the Mila Institute in Montreal who actually trained the neural nets. Um, and it was a matter of actually trying to give it all this data that we got from the Freesound data set. It was actually the second data set we used. We used the Urban AK sound data set out of, um, out of New York first, um, and then just basically running it through and teaching the neural nets. In terms of the mapping and analysis, um, I, I know how to make maps. And so uh, what I do is, um, and, and I've had, um, before I was an academic, I spent 15 years in administration. And so I, spent a lot of time working with spreadsheets and doing pivot tables and doing charts and making sense of crazy data. Um, one of my marketing agencies did a data intelligence service where they had to like clean up data and invite people to events. And so I worked with some horrible, horrible data sets of data coming from some big companies who should know better. Um, so um, because I know how to do that stuff fast, I often and will just teach my students how to do it. So it's usually a process of um, my students are, I have some who are in the GIS program at Waterloo. Um, I have a grad student from planning who's actually doing a lit review for me now, uh, the great Kevin Bonnell, he is awesome. Um, and then I have students who are able to do the technical end. So usually students kind of come in knowing how to do some part of what they're, they're asking, what I'm asking them to do. And then we sort of commit to me teaching them and them kind of learning the rest. I mean, the reason why you get this money is you can, so you can provide students with jobs where they can learn skills and they can actually use that stuff when they go into the workforce. So um, I kind of like teaching, teaching my students how to do things. We have open, um, we actually had the night before this, we had open, I have open like RA hours where I'm just kind of online on where by by myself and people jump in and ask questions. So we were trying to solve a problem with data that won't upload. Um, and, and then, uh, and then uh, one of my other students was trying to get me some outputs of maps that I could show you guys today. So I think that it's, it's really important for me to help students. Um, it's really important for me to have a mostly BIPOC group. Um, and because I think that it is important to understand this data, it's, it's when you have some skin in the game. And I think that also, um, I, I really want to help students of color get uh, a leg up in academia. Um, having started a tenure track position without ever being in HQP, without ever being on anyone's grant or even kind of knowing what SHRC was, um, I can say that, you know, figuring out how those systems work is really difficult. And having an opportunity to work with a researcher and to work with a professor is really, really valuable for students. So, you know, the professors in the room know this, but those who are PhD students intending to be professors, like find ways of actually helping out students um, because it gives them a leg up. 
Um, and I think that's super important. And so um, students, my students also will bring their own interests into the project. So um, a few are really obsessed with food security. Um, one was really trying to pull carding data over the summer, but was getting a lot of stops by police. Surprise, surprise. Um, and, and so I think that people sort of enabling your students to kind of follow their own interests uh, within the project is really important to me. It can mean that we get, that it takes us longer to get stuff done. Like it just can mean that there are twists and turns, but also this is like highly exploratory research. So I feel like if you want to do something, let's try it and see what's there. Um, and then also um, I've been really lucky because I've had a really amazing crew of people who get on really well and look after one another and check in with one another and kind of like buy each other for brunch and stuff. So they kind of like have that social life without me because I'm, I'm uncool because I'm a professor, but yeah. Thanks again, Jessica. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we've got one final question uh, from Kavi. Hello, thank you, Jessica, for your beautiful presentation. Um, thank you. I, was, um, I was just wondering, um, in terms of the kind of future of these sounds, the, the recordings, um, are you kind of sort of have a plan how you're going to store them, how they're going to be archived, and um, how people, uh, let's say, for in 50 years time, how, how people will be able to access these sounds if, if you are planning to store them for such a long time. And I also kind of was thinking in terms of us looking um, back at like a very old historical photographs of the city. Like for example, we have a beautiful resources at Toronto archives where we can see um, yeah. a, like a like hundred years um, back kind of the, the history of the city and how it's been changing. And it's been really interesting to be able to tap into that sort of like a time slice. So do mm. you see a sort of similar kind of meaning for these recorded sounds that they might be some sort of like a window into the past of the city um, and yeah. I think that's a really, um, thanks very much for that. I think that, um, I would hope so. Um, the uh, one of the things um, because because we're at universities and you guys are lucky because you have this at York too is that um, I'm trying to actually um, ensure that that this work is backed up through an institutional repository. So um, hence the move over to Microsoft because for some reason Waterloo really loves Microsoft. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm try I I because it is, um, I'm part of an institution, I do want it to be housed so it is accessible. Um, in terms of having the data open for other researchers, that's part of the thing that I have to ask people permission in terms of sharing their data within the app because that's, there's an ethical dimension to that. Um, and uh, having a repository would be really great. In terms of uh, future sounds, I think that would be really interesting. And I think that that is, um, that is where it becomes really amazing to be able to map old data onto new data and being able to look at that. One of the things um, I was hoping to do this week, and unfortunately I did not have time to do, was um, because I had made those uh, maps of New York, a while ago, I was like, oh, I need to make a post-COVID New York City sound map um, and, and pull that stuff down and actually see how that's changed. So that's one of the things I'm going to do. It's reading week next week, which reading week slash grading week for yeah, mm -hmm. grading. Um, so when I'm not grading, I'm going to be, I'm going to be actually uh, pulling down that data and trying to make some new maps around that just because I'm really curious. Um, it's super, it's funny because um, in Canada, getting access to noise complaints is really, really hard um, because it, it's it's around privacy, right? In the U.S., they don't care. They're like, this is where the sound was. This is where the complaint was. <laughs> like, they'll just tell you. You can pull that stuff down. Um, whereas in uh, Canada, you know, you can't, you can kind of pull it and divide it up um, by forward citation area, which is the first part of your postal code. But really, you can't get much smaller than that which is unfortunate because you get all sorts of uh, interesting sonic mysteries. In my, in my first slide, I had um, um, what you were looking at was Ottawa and the noise complaints. And almost all the noise complaints come from one neighborhood in Ottawa. It's where the university is. And, and, but it's surrounded by people who are no longer in university. So you can tell who's calling with 
on the other, right? Mm -hmm. Thanks for staying over everyone. It's like 520. <laughs> yeah, this is a lively conversation. It's right? cocktail hour somewhere, everybody. I need cocktail hour in my home. Cocktail hour in my home. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so if there aren't any more questions, I've, a few people have left, Jessica. They've left farewells and thank yous, and this was awesome. Oh. I'm so sorry we had to leave. Sarah had to leave as well. But uh, in general, I think um, this has been really, really interesting. Um, and as, as is obvious from the, all the conversations. So we'll give you a, an applause and uh, probably digital emojis or hands or yes. And thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I'm really delighted. And thanks everyone for coming on the Friday before reading week. <laughs>